Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today is Vanessa Fleming from Ocean Knits and Ocean Fiber. Welcome to my channel. <laughs> well, we've met uh, actually my very first guest of Fiber Chats, Joshua from Blue Fiber Company, was the one who introduced us. And he's very near and dear to my heart. And if you guys haven't watched that interview, it's very special because it was taking place over Instagram completely unprepared whether like I didn't know what I'm doing and he didn't know what he was doing and we didn't even know how to go live so it's a little bit of a mess but it's very sweet mess and he gave me the bravery of trying to approach other people to be guests of my channel and start my channel so I'm glad that he introduced us Tell me your fiber story. Like, when did you learn to knit, and at what point did you decide to start yarn dyeing company? Uh, yeah, I started knitting um, when I was really little. Um, it's a generational uh, tradition in my family. My grandmother, great grandmother, my mother—they all knit. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up being exposed to knitting. And then when I was in high school, you know, I did scarves, didn't really take it seriously. Same with college. And then when I uh, graduated university, I became a fisheries observer. So I was a marine biologist working aboard fishing boats. And that, you know, included a lot of downtime for me. So I started picking up knitting again and uh, definitely excelled in my level of knitting because of how much downtime I had especially with a lot of uh, YouTube tutorials and just kind of self-taught myself to, to get to the next level. <clears throat> and then in 2018, I started knitting sweaters and garments and realized that they weren't really made for my body type. And so I had to alter a lot of the patterns. And that's when I realized like, oh, you know, maybe I should start creating knitting patterns that are a little bit more made to measure, similar to crochet patterns. So in 2020, <clears throat> at first I started doing uh, ready to make, like ready to make knitwear for people who were not knitters to buy from me. And I realized that I actually, uh, I'm not a big fan of repetitive knitting. So I don't like knitting the same thing over and over again for, for resale. I've knit garments for myself over and over again, but it's different because I choose to do that. Mm -hmm. So I decided to change my business model and went into knitting patterns. And then I did that for about three years. And in 2022, I started to kind of, you know, play around with yarn dyeing. Um, but didn't really take it seriously until last year. And the reason why I started getting into yarn dyeing was I wanted to make my own knitting kits. Um, I just thought it would be really fun. I love the process of creating my brand and creating knitting kits and all the little details that go into it. I've also, you know, really leaned in heavy into my marine biology background and where I live on the coast. So everything is very much ocean themed. So my first couple of collections, I was still trying to find my niche, um, but now I think my niche is very much ocean. So any of the names, like I have, you know, a purple color called jellyfish. I have a variegated color called grapeberry reef because I went and dived the grapeberry reef. So a lot of my colors, um, the inspiration is pulled from my own personal experiences in the water. Um, but yeah, that's how it all started. It kind of... Uh, was also a project that like my husband and I could do together because I was always working on patterns and he felt left out that he couldn't do anything so he's been a big part of yarn dyeing um oh, let's talk a little bit about that experience yeah. because when you first like I hear a lot when yarn dyers start dyeing yarn in the beginning it's all sort of touch and go and you don't really know what you're doing and sometimes it's really successful and other times it's total disaster when you burn the yarn and the color is not happening <laughs> how you envision it what was your journey like um yeah I, a couple years ago or <clears throat> I think it was in 2021 I needed a pink color for a project that I was doing so I just used food coloring um, and looking back on the video I even made like a little Instagram video tutorial on how my, like my journey went with it and I was very lucky I didn't burn any yarn. Um, the color came through. I even used, I was using like a single, uh, you know, chunky yarn, single plies. So I'm very lucky that it didn't like felt. 
Um, <clears throat> I think it just kind of came a little like naturally to me. I didn't have any issues. And then I had some friends that were into yarn dyeing and they kind of showed me a little bit of their process. Um, and so I took that on and, and I, you know, I grew up as a scientist, so like chemistry was, you know, one of my strong subjects in school and yarn dyeing is very much chemistry. I, I weigh everything and, um, figure out the ratios and the color mixing and stuff. So, um, it's been a journey. I can definitely see the difference between when I first started versus now. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's been really fun. And I must say, I've been very lucky. I haven't had any, like any major issues. So, um, so far all my yarn has turned out how I imagined it. So what's the chances of you repeating a yarn color, like after a certain period of time? Um, yeah, when I first started, uh, re kind of replicating that colorway was really difficult because one, I wasn't really writing down anything that I was doing, um, which was very similar to newer design. I'd always be cursing myself because I would get into the zone and start designing and never write anything down. And then I'm trying to write the pattern and I'm like, you know, trying to read my knitting. So <clears throat> replicating at the time was a little difficult, but now I'm very diligent. I write every, sing every single thing that I do. Um, I even take videos of the process too when I first do a colorway and take photos. So now when I replicate a colorway, it turns out, you know, it's never going to be a hundred percent because it's hand dyed, but it's the, at least the, the color concentrations are going to be the same. And my tonals, I feel like are pretty, pretty spot on because it's uh, a lot easier to get an accurate, uh, replicate, uh, replicate of, of the tonal. Well, you mentioned that some of your colors or most of your colors are inspired by ocean. So you just came from Cancun vacation. How mm -hmm. many color ideas did you come back with? So many. Um, the sunsets were ridiculous. I actually didn't end up getting to do any snorkeling or diving. It was a, we did like a friend vacation. So it was a little bit more of like the sightseeing part of it. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of color inspiration. I think more so when we went to a town where they uh, produce linen garments and all of the embroidery, like I'm actually wearing right now. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, the color palettes are a little different from mine. They're a lot bolder, but I might have some fun experiment with that and maybe do like a, a Yucatan colorway. So. That would be great. So when you started, you wanted to create kits for your designs basically mm -hmm. that's still what you mainly do like you create yarn for the kids I actually just did my first kit so it's a lot lengthier of a process um you know trying to perfect everything I haven't been uh knitwear designing as much because yarn dyeing has definitely consumed like my last year and a half so um now that I'm feeling more comfortable on the yarn dyeing side I'm kind of catching up on the knitwear design but I made my first kit <clears throat> and we had Rose City Yarn Crawl um, the weekend before I left for Mexico. So that was two weekends ago. It was on the March 9th. And um, it was a cheeky checky beanie kit, which I think I have an example. Um, it's a checkered beanie, really simple, uses two colors. And um, I thought that would be a really fun and simpler project to start with for the knitting kids instead of going straight into like a sweater but I have a lot more ideas um and you know just working behind the scenes to get all of those ready well I hear like you juggling a lot of balls because not only you're designing and that's a full-time job on its own but then you're dyeing yarn and then somehow you have to market it all what's your favorite part about this whole thing and what's most frustrating um yeah it's a lot because I also work as a full-time marine biologist on top of it too um you know I think currently my favorite part is definitely yarn dyeing um I don't I'm not knitting as much as I would like I'm trying to be a little bit more active in my lifestyle because I felt like with network designing, I was, you know, sitting a lot with knitting and writing down the patterns and stuff. So currently I would say creating a new colorway 
has been um, kind of a form of therapy for me. Um, it keeps my body active. So, you know, my mental health is getting better because of that. And then just working with colors and finding an outlet to be creative um, has, has been really enjoyable. Talk to me about marketing. Talk to me about social media and how you promote those kits and how you sell this yarn. Is it difficult to make yourself different stand up, stand up from like the rest of the yarn that are out there? Yeah, I uh, I used to be really good at marketing and social media. I grew quite fast because I was so consistent with, um, you know, showing up on social media and, and working the algorithm to my advantage. Um, but I definitely, you know, doing that for two years straight and it was during the pandemic. So I had a little bit more free time because I wasn't, you know, out socializing and having a normal life during the pandemic. Um, I felt a little bit of a burnout from it the last year. So <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out a way to market my brand without having to rely solely on social media. And I think one of the biggest things that I've done that has made a huge impact on my brand, but also has made it more fun is doing shows in person. So I did my first show in Portland, Sacred Sacred Sheep, which Ritual Dyes, a yarn store in Portland, um, hosted. And that was so much fun. I met so many different people. Um, it was really good to connect with people in person. And also for people to realize that I'm not just, you know, this huge social media account and brand. I'm also just a one woman circus show running everything pretty much. Um, and then I did a trunk show for Christmas time, which was also really fun. Met some really amazing crochet artists that I'm hoping to work with in the future. And then Rosity Yarn Crawl. So <clears throat> I think uh, I'm definitely leaning more into the in-person connections. It may not grow um, my brand on social media as big, but I think it's helping me push my brand out and having that personal connection is going to make me stand out from someone who is, you know, solely just doing stuff on social media. So, and I think because I put my heart and soul in it is very like ocean themed and everything is what I absolutely adore. People see that. Um, but yeah, it is, it's hard to feel like you're unique compared to all the other yarn dyers, but there's space for all of us. So never worried about it. Well, tell me how, what goes into preparation for uh, an in-person yarn show? Describe <laughs> like the few days before, like. Uh, it's pretty hectic. My first one, um, I was asked to, uh, they asked me if I wanted a bigger space. So it was a little bit chaotic the two weeks leading up to it because I ended up dying. I had to dye a lot more yarn since I had a bigger space. And I also had no idea like, like what base do I provide? What colors do I focus on or any of that? Um, and I just kind of went with my intuition and I really had this vision of doing a, I have, I worked really hard on a, a rainbow tonal set. And so I really focused on that with the variegated. I had a, uh, like a yarn aquarium. So some of my yarns glow in the dark is similar to Josh's like reactive colors. Just kind of wanted to make it feel like when somebody was coming into my booth that they were like underwater, kind of like scuba diving. Um, but yeah, it's chaotic. I pride on being very organized, but <laughs> it's still kind of all over the place. That first show, I, I think I did pretty well considering I went into it blindly. And um, when I did Rose City Yarn Crawl, I felt like I died. I brought like way too much yarn because again, I didn't know it was a six by three table, I think. Um, but I ended up almost selling out. So I was really glad that I did more. And I think as a yarn dyer, since yarn doesn't go bad, um, do more than you are expecting to sell just in case, because you can always, you know, sell the rest on your website or, or do a sale. And, but it is, it's chaotic. Uh, I was prepped a week before Rose City Yarn Crawl. So that felt really good to like have everything done the weekend before. So I wasn't scrambling the morning of, um, and I'm hoping for flock that I'm doing in August. I'm hoping to actually get everything dyed up in the next couple of months so I can enjoy my summer and not be stressing out. But we'll, 
we'll we'll see if that actually happens so how do you juggle it with working full time <clears throat> when do you actually dye yarn like what's your day look like <laughs> um I when I first started yarn dyeing I did everything out of my kitchen so it was weekends and evenings any any free time that I had um <clears throat> but now that I've moved into my own studio space I invested in an oven and that has changed my yarn dyeing life so much because I can dye a month's worth of yarn in just one day and so that's really helped me out. Um, I'm not trying to do more. I'm trying to do the same amount, but have a little bit more balance in my life because I do have a full-time job. So usually I'll go in on, you know, really early Saturday morning, my husband will come with me and we'll just <clears throat> get ourselves organized. We'll get all of our dye lots ready, all of our colorways. We'll figure out, you know, what we're dying for the day. We might even do that the Friday night before. And we'll get every, while he's soaking everything, I'll start prepping all of my dyes. And then we'll just start dyeing everything, getting everything into the pans. And then, you know, usually about lunchtime, we'll throw everything into the oven and then we can turn on the oven. And then we have the rest of the day to, for ourselves, we'll go to the beach, we'll go for like a long lunch. And then in the evening, we'll turn the oven off or we'll get his mom who lives um, down the street from our studio. She'll go and turn the oven off for me. And then we let that sit overnight. So it's been it's been set with the heat, but then it cools overnight. And then we'll go in Saturday, uh, Sunday morning and rinse everything. So it definitely takes up our, our weekend, but we enjoy doing it. And so we just think of it that way that it's not, it's not work. We choose to do it. We enjoy to do it, but the oven has definitely made it. So we don't have to go every weekend. We can get a lot done. I think we can currently right now fit like a hundred skeins. So we can do a hundred skeins on the weekend. So just pretty well, good. Let's talk about your husband. You mentioned to me that he's not the neater yet. Um, how did he start with his interest in yarn dyeing? Um, he's been very supportive, um, not only in my career, but also with Ocean Knits. Uh, he definitely is the motivation behind everything that I do because um, I can get very self-conscious and be like, oh, people are already doing this. I don't need to do it. And so he gives me that boost of confidence. And then with yarn dyeing, he, lo he absolutely loves colors. Um, it's one of his favorite things, like one of his favorite color combos is like pink and purple and blue. He's not um, a typical husband who's like, oh, that looks like the same color, you know, like he actually notices. Um, and he pulls inspiration from like LP albums. So he listens to a lot of like older 60s, 70s music and a lot of their albums are very psychedelic looking. Right. Um. <laughs> and he's slowly learning so when we dye yarn together I'll tell him about all the different bases and um yeah he's just a really good sport about it he enjoys it he thinks it's funny um uh, if you ask him like what the difference between sock and fingering is he knows it um he's just slowly learning about my world um but yeah his interest in it only it only comes from the fact that I have an interest in it so I tried to teach him how to knit, but it didn't right. happen. Yes. It didn't happen yet. Um, so he has his own company. He, he's not part of Ocean Knit. Um, he is. So Holland Bear Fibers is just an extension of Ocean Knit. So since Ocean Knits is very much like Ocean Fibers, the yarn dye inside of it, it's, you know, ocean themed. He wanted to create his own little sub brand, Howland Bear Fibers, um, that's just yarn that's based off of LP album covers. Because um, he has a music background, he was in a band, his entire family are musicians. Um, so he thought it would be really fun to do that. Um, and it's been really fun. We've only done two colorways so far, um, but we plan on doing more this summer. But yeah, it's fun for him. Like, I obviously help him with the process of it because he's still learning about the yarn dyeing part of it. Um, but yeah, it's just like a little, it's under the ocean knits umbrella. Are you concerned it's going to get competitive? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, generally I'm dyeing the yarn, so <laughs> it's still part. Um, I help him with the colors and stuff, but he's still, you know, I, 
when I dye yarn, I think of it as a uh, knitter's point of view. So how is this going to look, look when it's knitted up where, you know, he had um, four skeins in the pan and he was really trying to like add the colors exactly how the LP looked. And I tried to explain to him that the, all the skeins will be completely different if you do it like that. So um trying to get him to understand that you can use the pull the colors from the album but mix it up and stuff so now I don't I think our color palettes are completely different because of the the inspiration that we pull from so right well do you think like when you look back at before you were dyeing yarn when you were just designing or just knitting uh and now do you feel like you have better understanding on fiber and like what's going to look good in the insert for certain design? Yeah, definitely. I think when I was a knitwear designer, um, I was very much new at uh, how bases knit and drape and structure. Um, but as a yarn dyer, just because of, you know, I want to know more about the bases that I'm dyeing and that I'm selling. And um, I realized uh, <clears throat> something could be the same weight, but you know, knit up completely different, have completely different drape to it. Um, so that's been really fun. And also learning about where the fibers come from and, and how they're made and how they're spinned up and stuff. It's been really interesting. Well, a lot of uh, yarn dyers in the U.S. using the same meals. So it's pretty much like everybody gets their, you know, raw stuff from the same place. Yeah. How do you decide on what basis to use? So I think I focus more on um, what knitwear designs I've used. So, you know, obviously um, DK is, is a big base that I use in a lot of my designs. Uh, I have a couple of designs that I use the blown alpaca. So that's another one that I use. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, moving forward, I'm actually pulling inspiration from bases. And I'm like, oh, what can I design with this base? Like a boucle, like a really chunky boucle. Um, you know, what can I make with this? Maybe a balaclava. So it's been really fun to like kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, but I think moving forward, now that I have a better understanding of yarn dyeing and basis, I would like to kind of shift my business into a little bit more um, eco-friendly basis and maybe work with uh, local mills and do smaller batch because I don't ever plan on doing this full time this will always be uh, I mean I do do a full time but it's with my job as well so I'd like to move away from maybe the mills that everybody else uses um, and try to get into a niche because of my background in in biology and stuff so if you were stranded on an inhibited island and you could only bring one base what would it be uh, fingering because it would just go much longer take it a lot longer to yeah if I had to bring one project it would be like a dress and fingering weight because <laughs> you'd have days and days of knitting with it so well educate me and my viewers on the difference between fingering and sock what is the difference so fingering is actually the weight so fingering is uh generally a four ply um, and it's about 450 yards, 400 meters per 100 grams. And sock is essentially fingering weight, but it has a percentage of nylon in it. And generally, you're going to see about 25% nylon. And the reason for this is it, adding nylon to a base is going to give it um, more structure. So it's going to hold up better. And the reason why it's called sock is we use it for socks, right? So you want to have that nylon in your sock to, to help the heel and the toe from wearing down too fast. So, right. Well, when you look at other people on Instagram and you see something they create with your yarn, do you ever want to stop and like, what did, what did you do? Like, this is not what that yarn was supposed to become. Like, do you ever <laughs> have that mo moment of panic that like you wish you could have? Uh, educate everybody about what your vision for the yarn was yeah I haven't come across that yet um I have the opposite way where someone looked at one of my mohair designs which was lace weight and they thought that they could just hold two strands of lace weight that wasn't a fluffy yarn um and they were very confused on the on their swatch and how it didn't come out 
Um, and that was the only time that I've been like, ah, you know, you have to use, it says specifically, this is a mohair top and mohair lace weight is going to act a lot differently than a non mohair, like a non fluffy base. That's lace, weight. like lace weight itself is just so thin, but the mohair adds, you know, more, more depth to it because of the fluff. Um, but yeah, so far I haven't seen anyone use my yarn for like a base and used it for something. And it's been, so I've been very lucky that way. Um, but I am, you know, I redid my bases and tried to add a little bit more description to each base, um, added a crochet side to it, even though I, I don't crochet and have not, I had to do a lot of research for that. Um, I want people to like have an understanding of like what they should use the space for, but you know, I mean, with anything, you can go ahead and experiment you never know, it might come out really good. And, um, I I've seen that a lot where people will use really thin yarn on really large needles and get like this really funky garment out of it. So, um, I think with rules on like where you use your bases don't really apply anymore because, knitting is seen as an art so you can just go in any direction that you want well lots of times when I come to a yarn store and a yarn will catch my attention I'll buy it without really having a plan for what I'm going to do is it just because I like that specific the touch of the yarn or the color of the yarn or the texture of the yarn whatever it is right and almost 100 percent of the time I will be asked like so what are you going to make this it and the answer will always be like, I don't know yet. <laughs> you ask your customers what they're going to make with your yarn. Um, Not really, because I also do that. I will also buy yarn that I'm like, I just love this yarn. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Um, And I think, you know, when at shows, people are buying yarn generally just to buy yarn because of the colors or the feel of it, or you really like, you know, the, the owner of the brand and you like the owner. So from my personal experience, uh, it's been really rare when I've bought yarn for specific projects. I usually just, I'm like, oh, I love this color so much. I definitely want to make something bigger. So I'm going to buy like a larger amount. Um, I think I had some newer bases at Rose City Yarn Crawl. So people would ask me like, oh, what would you make with this? Um, and then I, you know, like the, the chunky boucle and I'm like, yeah, I grab a couple of those and you can make like a really fun, quick balaclava with it. Um, or I had a cashmere base that was really soft. And so people were asking me like what I can make with it. And I'm like, one skein will make a beanie. Um, it's also like a perfect base to make like a, like a baby beanie, maybe not a baby garment because it's hard to wash, but it's so soft. Um, but yeah, I've never... I've never asked people what they're going to, because I just assume they're like me, just buying to, just buying to buy. Do you like buying other people's yarn or since you started dyeing it, there's no point for it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I, uh, at Rose City Yarn Crawl, I was only supposed to be there for a couple hours. So I was really excited to go to other stores, but ended up just staying there all day because it was so busy. Um, but Josh actually drove me around the day before and yeah, I can't help it. Like, um, uh, you know, I have such a specific palette with the pastel bright colors um, and ocean theme. And so it's really fun to buy um, colors that I would never dye myself, but I, I really enjoy it. So um, for me, I love, I love knitting with colors. I don't necessarily wear them, but I just dye everything black after. So I'm like, doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm, this looks really fun to knit. So I'll make something with him and figure out what I want, what color I want to dye it after. Oh, that's funny. Well, it's all your busy lifestyle and full-time job and another full-time job of yarn dyeing and, <laughs> and all of that, right? Do you feel like it took any joy out of your knitting? Like before when you didn't have it as a business and you just used to knit that scarf occasionally? Um, I think, you know, since I've made it into a business, um, it's just so much more than knitting now. Um, you know, usually when I'm knitting something, it, generally it's like a new design. It doesn't always, you know, end up being a design that I sell, but it ends up being, a, you know, a new design. And I love that creative process of it. So before, 
you know, I would just make someone else's pattern or I would just knit something. It was fun, but I definitely was missing something. Um, and so that, that design side of it has been, um, really nice, but yeah, there are times when I get a little burnt out, especially when I'm like really excited about a new design and I get to a point, I'm like, this is not going to work out. And so then I get a little flustered or when I finish a project and now I'm like, okay, what do I do? I feel that pressure to like design something new. Whereas I'm like, I can just knit something for fun. Um, so trying to find balance with that has been difficult, but I'm knitting a, like a cheeky checky beanie right now. So it's the design that I already have and it's really fun to knit, but just mindless. Cause I don't have to write anything down or do that part. When you mentioned that, like you learned to knit because you had generation of women in your family knitting, do you feel like it brings you some special joy knowing that you continue in this tradition? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've, I've made the women in my family really proud because my mom only really makes scarves. Um, she just knits to, you know, it's like a form of therapy for her. She doesn't really take it any further than that. She doesn't knit from patterns or anything. Um, <clears throat> and then her mother, my grandmother, um, would always make like little Barbie clothes and would make like cute little sweaters, but they were always, um, like the sleeves were too long or the neckline was too big. So she was a really good knitter, but <clears throat> they have both said that I've taken, you know, our, our tradition of, of knitting to like a new whole level. Um, so it's been really fun for them to see that thinking about you know they when they taught me when I was really little I don't think they ever thought that I would make a whole business out of it so yeah did you think that it might turn one day into business <sighs> I mean I definitely grew up in a very uh business oriented family like my parents own restaurants and um my mom was also uh, a really successful real estate agent when we lived in Las Vegas so I definitely, my genetics, I have that in me. I find it really hard to not modernize on something that I am good at. Um, but I never in a million years, when I when I first started, I think it was 20, 2016, I had made some like little cows and scarves and my mother-in-law had a, uh, a, like a, like a plant store. And so I did a little pop-up at her plant store and no one came or I think I had my our best friend's mom buy something and that was about it um never thought you know it was just fun I'm like oh I might sell some stuff never thought it would ever turn into what it is today so how do you deal with disappointment in life like when you design something and it doesn't sell or you create some new color that you think is gonna be flying off the shelves and nobody wants it how do you yeah pick yourself up yeah, I think a lot of knitwear designers and yarn dyers can relate. Um, usually the things that blow up for me are the things that I don't anticipate to blow up. And then I'll have, it's the same with content. Like I'll be really excited to post something and it just, nobody cares. Um, and yeah, it does happen with colorways and knitwear designs, but you know, I just, not everything can can be everyone's favorite. And I just, I just move on from it. Um, and I think I, when I first started, I felt this pressure to design stuff that I knew would blow up on social media, but I didn't feel like it was, you know, didn't feel like it was my personality coming through. And I also like, didn't really love knitting it and I didn't love wearing it. So I'm like, why am I doing this? Um, so now that I've shifted it and I only design stuff that I want to wear, that I want to make if it doesn't do as popular, it doesn't really matter because I was going to make it for myself anyways. Just happened to, to create a design out of it. But. I mean, when I'm thinking about social media, it's like this, um, a little bit of a bizarre feeling because you're sitting home and you're talking to the world of strangers about something that's very niche to you. Mm -hmm. hope to find it's like basically like digging gold like finding gold in the sand you know it's like you're trying to find people who can get you who understand your enthusiasm who have the same vision for like who love the same thing that you do um and a lot of times you would put something out there and 
like you said, nobody is watching and you have this feeling that you're just being silly, like you're talking to the world and nobody sees it. Is that Does that make it surprising? Like when you come to in-person show and people come to buy your yarn, not because they need another skein of yarn and not even because they obsessed with the color, but because of you? Yeah, that was uh, <clears throat> my first experience with that, I think was Rose City Yarn Crawl. Um, because Sacred Sheep, I was, you know, it was my first show. And I had a lot of people from Sacred Sheep or discovered me through Sacred Sheep's, you know, like they weren't able to attend it, but they were following along um, that were really excited to like meet me, Oceanits. And that was uh, very weird because I just, I'm still kind of like, oh, I'm very new to the, even though I've been knitting for a really long time, I feel like I'm still very new to the community. Um, I have definitely have succeeded a lot on the social media, but there's like this whole other community in person with all of these different in-person shows. Um, and my husband told me, he's like, yeah, you know, we, uh, I guess people came the day before on Friday and they were like, we're going to come back on Saturday. Cause we're really excited to meet Vanessa of Ocean It's and, um, it definitely feels really surreal and it um, feels really good to to meet those people that are very supportive of what I do and sometimes I'm kind of like why <laughs> why do you support me <laughs> um, but that's just you know my insecurity I think most people that own a small business you're always going to have a little bit of that uh, you know self-doubt um, so why, do you, like why do you think they support you um why like why do I think they support me I don't know maybe they really love ocean stuff like me like I'm obsessed with jellyfish so I have a lot of jellyfish items and I noticed a lot of people being like I love jellyfish too so um which isn't a really common sea animal for people to get usually it's like dolphins or turtles and seahorses and stuff so it's been really fun um I mean I don't know why they support me I hope they support me because they see how much I love it. And then I don't, I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love to do it. You know, I, I, my full-time job supports me financially. So <coughs> I kind of have fun with it and I hope that they, they, they see that and that it's um, not to profit on the, the industry, but to contribute to it. Well, it's basically like you have to decide for yourself at some point. And the reason I'm asking you, because I'm sure there is some yarn dyers who are just starting the business and they're trying to get some brilliant idea from how you grow on social media and how you promote yourself and why people choose your yarn over somebody else's. And part of it is sharing your story and being comfortable to tell about yourself. How much do you share? Um, I, I, I think, you know, when I first started social media, I shared pretty much my entire life. Um, and I think that's why I grew pretty fast in like a year or two, um, because I was constantly sharing every aspect of my life. But, you know, now that I am back in the office part time, I can't really share too much of that because I, I work for NOAA for the government. So I have to be careful what I share about that. Um, and I also, you know, for my own mental health, I try and keep some things private to myself as well. Whereas when I first started, I didn't really, I just kind of shared everything and then, and then went from there. Um, but I do share like what I love, um, why I, I dye certain colors, why I design certain things. I'm very open about the fact that, um, you know, I, I struggle with finding clothes that fit me. Um, you don't have to be plus size to have that difficulty. Like you can also just be a different shape. Um, and I think a lot of, uh, women can relate to that, um, probably more so than, than not. Um, but yeah, I, I share my process of how I do everything. Like I do little tutorials on how I dye stuff. Um, I definitely don't I want anyone to feel like I'm hiding anything. I'm more than willing to even with the knitwear design side, like if anybody ever had a question, I would, I mean, I don't know if it's right, but it's just the way that I do it and more than happy to share that. So, How do you perceive other dyers? Like, are they your colleagues, your mentors, your inspiration, your competition? How do you see them? 
Um, I would definitely say inspiration. Um, you know, a lot of different yarn dyers. I've been obsessed with hand dyed yarn since I really started knitwear designing and going to yarn stores. Um, I had a yarn store open up in Seaside, uh, Seaside Yarn and Fiber. Ali is the owner. And she's actually one of the main people that like got me to start knitwear designing and, and fall in love with, you know, different yarn brands. Um, and I love finding local yarn brands. So if I see that they're from Oregon or Washington, um, I absolutely adore it. Um, when I went over to London, I found Le Bien Ami and she was from Paris. So I was like, oh my goodness, like French yarn. Cause I'm born in France. And my dad is French. So I wouldn't say that, um, you know, I feel uh, competitive with them. I think we're all very much different and everyone has their own interpretation of like colorways. Um, and even like two colorways that might look very similar, still gonna be completely different because you hand dye it. So it's impossible to recreate what somebody else has done. And it's just really fun to see everyone's brand and how they grow as a yarn dyer when you, when you find them when they first start. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely inspiration. Can you imagine your life without knitting? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm definitely way more patient because when we were in Mexico and we had to wait for food at the restaurant, everybody was getting restless and drinking more beer. And I was just sitting there knitting, just happy. Like, um, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. I think about all the times that I traveled and I didn't have knitting with me. I'm like, what was I doing? Like I had so much time that I could have been knitting. So. so when it comes now, like you said that like at the beginning, when you were a child, you were just knitting simple scarves. And then with YouTube and everything, you were learning different techniques. What do you gravitate towards now? Like, do you go for complicated stuff or do you prefer some simpler knits? Um, I actually really enjoy color work and lace work right now. I mean, I absolutely adore a good stocking head project, you know, where you're just mindlessly knitting, but I do get very bored of that. Um, I definitely like something that I have to memorize. Um, so with lace, if I have to memorize like a six row repeat, I enjoy that. I do prefer to knit something that I don't really have to look at the pattern very much. So, um, you know, I, I'm more of a knitter on the go. It's pretty rare when, um, I used to knit a lot like at home in the evenings and stuff, but now I feel like I'm always doing something admin on my computer in the evening. So I just want to like relax and not be looking at a pattern, but color work has definitely been something that I really enjoy just simple color work too. Um, but, uh, I like smaller projects too. Like right now I'm on a balaclava and beanie. Like that's like all I want to make. Cause they're just so good. You throw them in a bag and you are ready to go. But I also want to sit down and like knit some sweaters because I feel like I don't really have that many. Um, I have a lot for my like knitwear samples that I have for yarn nine, but I need to make some stuff that I'll wear every day. I mean, I know it's a hard question to ask a yarn dyer, but like, do you have a favorite color? Ooh, uh, probably Great Barrier Reef. Uh, it, I use six different colors. And it's just a special colorway because diving the Great Barrier Reef was uh, a huge thing on my bucket list. When I met my husband, I was actually working and saving money to move to Australia because that's where I was hoping to go and look for some work. Um, but we met and then, you know, we got married the following year. And so that Australia never happened. And then I had the opportunity to present at an international conference so not only did I get to go to Australia, like I wanted to, but my husband came with me and it was with work. So that whole trip was really special. And then I got to go dive the Great Barrier Reef and then creating that colorway when I came home, it's just really special and means a lot to me. And I'm also like obsessed with the color itself. Every time I dye it on any different base, I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like I get so much satisfaction from seeing it dyed up. So any exciting shows coming up in your mm -hmm. yeah we have flock in august which we're really excited we were supposed to vend at it last year but my father-in-law passed away so we prioritized family um so we're really excited to you know 
finally be able to have that opportunity. Um, it's going to be a lot bigger of a show. I'm really excited to meet a ton of other yarn dyers and vendors and meet some more people. Um, I know a lot of people um, travel to flock to like they did last year. So where Sacred Sheep and Rose City Yarn Crawl was more like local of Oregon and Washington. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're really excited and we're hoping to like create a whole like new collection that's going to be the same, but also very different from what we've been doing. So we're really excited for that. And that's in, that's in the beginning of August. I well, can't wait to see that collection. And I'm so, I'm so glad that Josh introduced us and that I got to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Vanessa, for being my guest today. Awesome. Thank you.